Hi, I'm Eric Voss. In every holiday season, there's a handful of movies that I watch with friends and family. The top of that list is Home Alone. For a kid growing up in the early 90s, there really wasn't a better fantasy than a kid who talks back to his parents and nearly murders burglars and eats the most delicious mac and cheese. Oh wait, he doesn't. He just leaves it there. On this channel, we typically dive deep into the analysis and stuff you missed from superhero movies and other nerd stuff. But I figured, why not break down something you might actually be watching right now? So here is a special holiday breakdown of all the interesting details you might have missed in Home Alone. So here we go, let's start at the beginning. The McAllister's house was shot on location in Winnetka, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. It's actually just down the street from the church that Kevin goes to in the movie. And we meet the McAllister family, including Kevin McAllister, Macaulay Culkin, and his parents Kate and Peter, played by Catherine O'Hara and John Hurd, and his siblings Buzz, Megan, Lenny, and Jeff. And Jeff I always recognized as a kid as the Elder Pete from Pete and Pete on Nickelodeon. And right away, Jeff plays a little joke on Harry, Joe Pesci, casing the house in disguise as a police officer. He nearly hits him, and he's kind of foreshadowing a big moment later. Heads up! Actually, that later paint can knocks out Harry's gold tooth, which Kevin spots in this scene, where it sets off a red flag, alerting him that something's fishy about this guy, and it's a way that he recognizes him as the same guy later. The little Nero's pizza guy arrives, and he knocks over the McAllister statue, sets off the movie's recurring joke of drivers running into it constantly. Little Nero's is obviously a play on Little Caesars. And Kevin pisses off his whole family in the kitchen, where we meet Fuller, his cousin, who wets the bed. Fuller's actually played by Macaulay's younger brother, Kieran Culkin, who grew up as an actor in his own right. He appeared in Scott Pilgrim vs. the World and the show Succession. Now, this scene contains my favorite missable detail in this film. See, director Chris Columbus was concerned that Home Alone's central premise, a family leaving a boy home alone on Christmas Eve, would be too implausible. Like, how could a family do this? So he went to great lengths to justify all the ways the parents could overlook missing their son while leaving the country. And here is the best example of that attention to detail. Look closely as Kevin pushes Buzz and he spills the milk. It spills on the passports and the plane tickets, which Kevin's dad, Mop up with napkins and tosses in a big pile in the trash. Columbus includes an insert close-up of that trash can with Kevin's ticket visible among the garbage right before it gets covered up. And before we move on from this opening sequence, it also introduces us to Old Man Marley, the neighborhood snow shoveler who kindly salts the sidewalk so people don't slip on the ice. The boys like to tell urban legends that Marley keeps the bodies of people he's killed buried in the salt. I actually read another theory that the reason he salts the ice is because his wife slipped on that ice and died. Maybe because his son was supposed to salt the ice as a chore, but he forgot. And that's why the father and son don't talk to each other anymore. But, eh, I don't know. Not everyone who salts sidewalks does it for morbid, morbid reasons. The next morning, the family oversleeps and rushes to make their flight, and we get another knocked over statue gag, followed by the family scramble. Now, the music of this movie was composed by John Williams, and for me, he is a big reason this movie feels so timeless. But actually, the music here may sound familiar to you. Williams actually borrowed the whole orchestration the melody from Tchaikovsky, the Russian dance from the Nutcracker. Listen closely. <laughs> Williams is obviously one of the greatest film composers ever, but he does admit that a lot of his iconic scores were inspired directly from classic composers like Tchaikovsky and Wagner. Outside, Kevin's cousin Heather gets a head count of all the kids, counting the neighbor kid rooting through the airport shuttle van, which screws up her count, which allows them to overlook Kevin. But rewatching closely, in addition to this, Heather actually counts herself twice. So yeah, they had no chance at recognizing that their numbers were off. Now, this airplane is filled with little cameos from the director's family. The woman in the red sweater is Chris Columbus. Columbus's mother-in-law, and the baby that she's holding in her lap is Columbus's daughter. Meanwhile, the first-class flight attendant is played by Columbus's wife, Monica. Now, back at the house, Kevin realizes he has a place to himself, and he goes through Buzz's stuff. Now, the picture of Buzz's girlfriend, woof, has a whole story behind it. The director didn't want to ask a young girl to pose for this photo because he didn't want to traumatize a girl by calling her ugly. So he got around this by having his son dress up as the girl. Although, I gotta say, from personal experience, it doesn't exactly feel great to be a boy and be called an ugly girl, woof. Now, the rubbish Kevin watches is this old movie called Angels with Filthy Souls, which is not a real movie. They shot it specifically for Home Alone, but it is based on the James Cagney movie Angels with Dirty Faces. And Kevin sleds down the stairs out the front door, which, you know, it doesn't take a genius to see that it totally would not work. The stairs would lead Kevin directly into the wall. Now, by the way, this shot of him launching out the front door, along with all of Kevin's more dangerous stunts throughout the movie, were played by a 30-year-old stunt actor named Larry Nicholas. He was short enough to fill in for Kevin, from a distance at least. Next, we meet the Wet Bandits, Harry and Mar. 
Marv, played by Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern. They roll into the neighborhood in their okay plumbing van, which, you know, thinking about it, kind of ties into Marv's dumb calling card of flooding all the houses that they hit. Like, maybe Marv is a plumber, or the guy who owns his van is a plumber friend of his. So by flooding all these houses, it could create more business for them. The phone number on the side of the van begins with JK5, which if you look at the letters on an old touch tone, that would make this 555, which are the three digits that all phone numbers in movies and TV begin with. McAllister family arrives in the Paris airport. And look closely on the other side of that glass in the background. You can see a family holding a welcome banner. Now that was actually going to be a joke, but it was cut from the film. This is going to be Uncle Bob and his family who were greeting them. And the McAllisters are just gonna tear through this banner like football players as they rush to the phones. When Kate calls the cops to check in on the house, Larry, Officer Balzac, is played by actor Larry Hankin. You might recognize him as the scrapyard owner in Breaking Bad. I love how a piece of his donut falls out of his mouth and sticks to the phone receiver. And a patrol officer who checks in on the house is played by Columbus's father-in-law. Actually, if you look closely, you can see that he also ran his police car into the statue. <laughs> Later, after Kevin runs away from old man Marley at the drugstore and steals that toothbrush, he almost gets run over by Harry and Marv in their van with the Dodge head ornament telling Kevin to dodge it. This shot was actually filmed in reverse. When Harry and Marv check in on Kevin's house later, Kevin rigs it up to look like there's a rowdy party going on. Now, originally, Kevin was going to be playing piano in the scene, which would pay off all the piano lessons he had to take, but the filmmakers thought it'd be funnier to see him all strung up and dancing like this. You can see Kevin uses a cardboard cutout of Michael Jordan. You can actually see that Michael Jordan earlier in the movie on the door to Buzz's room. Now, as Kate tries to make her way back to Chicago, you can see at the Scranton airport desk, there's this guy in the background. Now, some conspiracy theorists believe that this was Elvis Presley, saying that this was proof that he was actually still alive. Eventually, some people dug into this and realized that this guy was, of course, not Elvis. This is an actor named Gary Grott. This is where Kate meets Gus Polinski, John Candy's character, Polka King of the Midwest, Kenosha Kickers. Apparently, Candy shot all of his scenes in one day. Now, back at the house, we get the creepiest shot of the movie. Kevin seeing Harry behind him in the window in the reflection of the tree ornament. If you look closely at his reflection, you can see this dark circle over Kevin's shoulder. That's actually the hidden camera lens. And as Kevin wanders the neighborhood, emotionally preparing for burglars to murder him, he stops by the church and makes peace with old man Marley. Now, notice the Band-Aid on Marley's hand here. This is a callback to his injured hand that scared Kevin earlier at the drugstore. The Band-Aid shows that it's healing and it's less intimidating to a kid. It reflects Kevin's softening attitude to the old man who still probably murdered people. And speaking of bizarre fan theories, as we see Kevin booby trap his home into a murder house, there were some theories that Kevin could have grown up into a psychopathic murderer, like another famous Chicagoan, H.H. H. Holmes, who lured people into a hotel custom designed to murder them. Others said that Kevin could have grown up to be Jigsaw from the Saw movies. Now, obviously, none of this is canon, but a few years ago, Macaulay Culkin did poke fun at this stuff as a mentally disturbed adult Kevin in a web series episode as an Uber driver. I defend off my house from two psychopath home invaders. Now, a few fun details about Kevin's showdown with Marv and Harry. The BB that Kevin fires at Marv's face was actually hand-painted into each frame by a low-budget local artist in Chicago who worked out of his home. The movie didn't really have a huge budget for visual effects. Harry burns his hand on the superheated doorknob and cools it off in the snow. This was actually a nod to Raiders of the Lost Ark when Tote burns his hand on Ravenwood's medallion and it sears an engraving on his palm. Daniel Stern didn't actually step his bare feet on the nail. Ugh, God, it's so hard to watch. It was made of rubber, and Stern wore fake rubber feet as he trudged through the snow. That would be really hard to do with bare feet. But the close-up of his feet cracking on the ornaments was actually his real feet. It's just the ornaments were made out of candy glass. Now, when Harry and Marv nearly grab Kevin upstairs, Kevin puts Buzz's tarantula on Marv's face. <laughs> Daniel Stern didn't actually scream out loud here. He just made this face silently pretending to scream so that he wouldn't spook the tarantula. And he added his amazing scream by dubbing it over in post-production. Harry and Marv catch up to Kevin in the house next door where Harry threatens to bite off his fingers. Apparently in one of these takes, Joe Pesci actually bit Macaulay Culkin's finger, leaving a permanent scar there. And those are all the details I spotted on Home Alone, a movie I'm gonna go rewatch right now because it just gets better and better with every rewatch. Comment down below with your favorite movie to rewatch this time of year and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at EA Boss and subscribe to New Rockstars for more deep dives into the movies and the TV you love. Marvel, Star Wars, Pixar, Harry Potter, we kind of do it all. Happy holidays and kids stop telling scary stories about creepy old neighbors who ice the sidewalks. They're doing you a favor and you know what? They've only killed like two kids on average tops. <laughs>